A mystery is a suspenseful story where a person investigates clues to solve a crime. Common elements in mysteries are, they might have detectives, suspects, victims, witnesses. Common settings might be everyday settings. Common themes include missing objects or people, secrets, or unexplained events. To compare and contrast stories in the same genre, ask yourself, how are the protagonists similar or different? How are the settings similar or different? How are the plots similar or different? And what similar topics and themes do the stories address? We are going to first read two texts, and then in a later video, we will answer the questions pertaining to these stories. The first story we are going to read is the case of the missing books. On the morning of Jerome's 10th birthday, he woke up in his bed to an immediate sense that something wasn't right. He opened his eyes to the morning sun and peered around his room. Something had changed. Something was missing. He realized quite quickly what it was. He normally kept a stack of books piled high in the corner of the bedroom next to his cupboard. The books were mostly detective mysteries, Jerome's favorites. Now, however, the stack of books was completely gone. They had vanished. Jerome's window, which he knew he'd shut the night before, was standing wide open. So right now, you should be thinking about the character in this story and the setting of this story. Jerome threw off his bed covers and raced downstairs. Mom, he yelled, walking in on his mother as she cooked pancakes in the kitchen. There's the birthday boy, his mother exclaimed. There's been a theft, said Jerome. His mother's eyes widened. What do you mean? All of my books have been stolen and my window was wide open. The cat burglar has struck again, said Jerome. The cat burglar was a notorious thief who had plagued the neighborhood months earlier. The burglar had broken into many houses and stolen valuable items like jewelry, watches, and money. Jerome and his best friend Daisy had desperately tried to crack that case but they never caught the culprit. Now it appeared that their nemesis was back. Fortunately, Daisy was already coming over to eat birthday pancakes with Jerome and to give him his birthday present, a brand new magnifying glass. It was the perfect opportunity for them to get started on the case of the missing books. Darling, said Jerome's mother, it's your birthday. Isn't there something else you would want to do besides try to solve mysteries? Solving mysteries was Jerome's favorite thing in the world, and they all knew it. So Jerome and Daisy raced to his room to get started with the investigation. First, Jerome used his new magnifying glass to carefully inspect the area around where his books normally stood. He could see scuff marks on the carpet that almost looked like the outline of a footprint, but a strange footprint, as if the culprit had been wearing slippers instead of shoes. Browning, Jerome took some photographs with his Polaroid camera. Daisy was examining the window sill. Hmm, she said, there seems to be something sticky here. She took a sample and added it to their evidence pile. So they're trying to uncover the mystery, right? That kind of sounds like fun. I like mysteries, do y'all? Me too. Now, there were quite a lot of books, said Jerome, so the thief wouldn't have been able to get away on foot Let's check the yard for signs of wheels. They headed out to the yard to look for marks in the driveway to suggest a getaway vehicle, a car, or perhaps a motorcycle, but they couldn't find any trace of a vehicle. Perhaps it was more than one thief, Daisy said, and they all shared the load. Jerome narrowed his eyes. He was thinking deeply when he noticed something over by the door of the garage. He raced over to pick up the object, it was one of his books. The Secret of the Wobbly Wheelbarrow. Looks like they dropped one, he said. That's strange, said Daisy. If they climbed straight out of your window and left by the front gate, why would they come past the garage? It's not along the way. No, said Jerome thoughtfully. No, it's not. 
He ran his hands over the cover of The Secret of the Wobbly Wheelbarrow and held the book up to his nose. The book had a strangely familiar smell about it. Jerome made a note in his notebook and they headed back upstairs to examine the evidence so far. There was the slipper footprint on the carpet, the sticky substance on the window, the dropped book, and the scent that Jerome had detected. Jerome and Daisy studied the clues, thinking hard. You know what, Daisy, said Jerome. I think you are right. I think there was more than one thief. How do you know, asked Daisy. Jerome picked up the sample of the sticky substance and held it to his tongue. It's as I suspected, he said. This is pancake batter. Also, this dropped book smells suspiciously like my father's shaving cream. The culprit, Daisy, are not cat burglars. They're my parents. Jerome marched to the lounge room, ready to confront his parents about why they had stolen his books, especially on his birthday. But as he walked into the lounge, the answer became obvious. His mother and father were standing proudly next to a big, beautiful wooden bookcase. It had five rows of sleek shelves and a glass case at the top for the most special and rarest titles. Lining the shelves of the bookcase were all of Jerome's missing books, the detective novels he loved so much. Happy birthday, Jerome, said his father, holding out his hands. What do you think? asked his mother. Your dad made it himself in the garage. Sorry, we had to steal away your books in the middle of the night, added his father. But we thought it would have more of an effect if the books were already on the shelves when you saw it. Jerome raced over and gave his parents a hug. I love it, he said. Thank you so much. There's just one book missing. He decided to place the secret of the wobbling wheelbarrow in the place of pride inside the special glass shelf at the top. Now, whenever he'd look at it, He'd remember his favorite mystery, the one that proved that not all thieves were bad. The case of the missing book had been solved. The Rainbow Vandal, Detective Sonny Sharp Eyes Sheridan, had been called to the town of Asheville to help with a particularly interesting case of graffiti vandalism. Normally, she wouldn't have been interested in petty vandalism, but this case was different. The Vandal of Asheville was quickly becoming known as the Rainbow Vandal because he or she wasn't just painting initials or a simple tag around town. The Vandal was painting large, elaborate works of art that glittered and gleamed in all of the colors of the rainbow. First, there had been a rainbow fish outside Bobby's fish and chip shop. Then there had been a rainbow zebra outside the town hall. After that, a huge rainbow castle had appeared outside the school. It's Bill, said Chief Inspector Wallace as he explained the case to Detective Sharp Eyes. This shocking pain is all over town. The vandal must be caught at once and punished. I understand, Chief Inspector, said Sharp Eyes. Can I please look at the case file? As Sharp Eyes carefully studied the case file on the rainbow vandal, she noticed a few important things. First, the vandal seemed to target institutions and important businesses. Remember, we're thinking about our settings and our characters compared to the story we read before. First, the vandal seemed to target institutions and important businesses around town, rather than just random fences or walls. Second, the vandal never painted up high, suggesting that the culprit might be short. Third, the vandal seemed to, be, to strike between the hours of 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. Interesting, mused Sharp Eyes as she looked at the photos of the vandal's handiwork. Then she headed outside to have a walk around Asheville and see the paintings in person. It was raining in Asheville, like always. The town was almost constantly covered in a gray cloud, and the buildings of the town reflected this. They were all gray, white, and brown without much personality or color to them. This is why when Sharp Eyes arrived at Bobby's Fish and Chip Shop, the vibrant rainbow fish that had been painted on the shop's front wall stood out so brightly. Sharp Eyes went into the shop to question Bobby about the incident. Like she suspected, Bobby confirmed that the vandal must have struck between the hours of 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. Bobby lived above the shop and had gone downstairs for a snack at 3 a.m. and the painting hadn't been there then. By the time he woke up at 6 a.m., it had appeared. 
Sharp Eyes asked Bobby a few more questions before she was finished. Thank you, Bobby, she said. You can now arrange to have the graffiti removed. The police station can supply a graffiti removal kit. Sharp Eyes noticed that Bobby looked slightly uncomfortable at this. She raised her eyebrows. You do want to remove it, right? She asked. Bobby shrugged. Well, he muttered, it's a pretty nice piece of art, isn't it? Sharp Eyes went to the town hall and then to the school next to see the rainbow zebra and the rainbow castle. While there, she spoke with the town counselors and the school principal. Her conversations with them went much the same way as the conversation with Bobby had. They all confirmed that the vandal must have struck between the hours of 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. When Sharp Eyes offered to supply free graffiti removal kits from the police station, like with Bobby, they all looked hesitant and mumbled. Well, it's a pretty nice piece of art, isn't it? So they're all like kind of liking it because remember that they said the town was dreary and kind of like yeah. mopey and drab and gray. and gray. Very good. So now that they're getting some pops of color around town, they're kind of liking it, right? Indeed, Sharp Eyes was noticing something. In the drab gray town of Asheville, which was always covered in rain or cloud, the rainbow vandals pieces of artwork were the only pops of welcome color. Sharp Eyes had a suspicion about where the vandal would strike next. As the vandal seemed to be targeting important institutions in town, it would make sense for him or her to narrow in on the police station. Early the next morning at 3 a.m., Sharp Eyes hid out in the alley behind the police station, waiting and watching. She was just starting to grow sleepy when a figure appeared on the street at 4.15 a.m. The figure was short, as Sharp Eyes had suspected, and carried a large black case and a torch. Sharp Eyes watched as the figure approached the police station and opened up the black case, propping the torch against it so that it shone directly on the wall. The figure then reached into the case, pulled out a vivid array of rainbow paints, and got to work painting the police station wall. Sharp Eyes could have apprehended the rainbow vandal right then. Instead, she watched in fascination as the vandal brought a world of color to the gray walls of Asheville. The vandal finished just as the sun was beginning to rise. The pale beams of morning sunlight illuminated the newest piece of artwork, a beautiful garden of rainbow flowers stretching across the police station. The rainbow vandal was beginning to pack up. It was Sharp Eye's last chance to catch and arrest the culprit. She stood in the alley watching as the vandal snapped the black case shut and started to walk away in the rain. Sharp Eyes let the vandal go. The next day, Sharp Eyes told Chief Inspector Wallace that she was unfortunately unable to solve the case. Was she really unable to solve the case though? No, no she chose not to because she kind of liked this, right? Don't worry, she said. Most vandals get bored quickly and leave one town for the next. You've got your graffiti removal kits. You can get rid of the graffiti and Asheville can return to the way it was before. However, when Sharp Eyes visited Asheville years later to work on a different case, she wasn't surprised to find that the work of the rainbow vandal was still there. The rainbow fish, the rainbow zebra, the rainbow castle, and the rainbow garden had all become attractions in the gray city and people came every day to take photos with the famous artwork. In fact, there was a petition going around to change the town's name from Asheville to Brightville. Sharp Eyes happily signed it before heading into Bobby's to enjoy a hot plate of fish and chips in a town that was no longer so gray. Now that we've read our stories, you can watch the next video where I will answer questions with my class comparing and contrasting stories of the same genre. We'll see you then.